citizenship. Citizenship. So in order to truly be sovereign, right now, uh, if you're a citizen of the corporation, you know, you're under their statutes and codes and your allegiance and your protections and your rights are guaranteed by the corporation. However, we are going to have a, uh, what do you want to call it, a um, guideline, to, uh, you know, primer, guideline, let's show those words up, up on here. Whoa, it's a, we're going to have a, is that how you spell it, primer? Guideline, outline, Q&A on getting citizenship elsewhere. Now, many people claim American national. If you were born in the common law on the land, in Texas or California, Republic, etc., uh, you can claim American national status. And there are court cases and so on and so forth that upheld, uphold that the corporation, you know, the U.S. or the U.K. or Canada or whatever, they do recognize your common law nationality. However, it's even better to go out of your way to set some things up abroad to get citizenship, to get a secondary citizenship. Okay, now you can travel with a passport, an ID, from somewhere else. And therefore, when an officer of the corporation stops you and wants to see your ID, you can show them, I'm not one of your cattle, I'm someone else's cattle. <laughs> but it helps you in the situation to uh, reduce their jurisdictional um, bounds to, uh, you know, to take you in and arrest you <laughs> or do whatever they want to do to you. Okay? And there are ways that you can get, um, from having a second passport, you can actually get a exemption from having a driver's license. I'm not giving legal advice, but you can look into it and we do have some material coming down the road where you do not need to get permission to um, do a lot of these things. Okay, there's also actually, you, do, you know, when people go and they start a business and they file you know, they file articles of incorporation or whatnot for a company. You know, you're registering the business and you're asking for permission to operate a business. So there's some things that we're working on at the moment to present with you realistic um, procedures and protocols in place that people are using and have been using for 10 plus years, probably even longer, but I traced it back the companies that I'm work that I'm you know partnering and working with have been doing this for 10 plus years having people to open up businesses without needing to be granted the permission so when you when you do stuff and you're asking for permission you know you give you're relinquishing your rights you're saying is that I don't have the right to do this please give me permission and please regulate me please tax me and regulate me and restrict what I can do and uh, find me and charge me and blah blah blah. So that is pretty cool that we're going to have some some realistic remedies tested and true. And the reason why they're not if they're not like listen guys if something's not available on the website at the moment, it's because we're still working on beta testing and doing our diligence um, before we uh, throw it out there. Okay, so those things are coming down the road. Um, realistic and proven and tested and true uh, traffic remedies that can get traffic tickets dismissed. 
is something that we're working on. And what else are we working on? We're going to get rid of this. We are working on, um, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of, an, of a preliminary outline about sovereignty and draw out a little uh, guide map. Is that a good word? Guide map? Uh, <laughs> road map. There you go. Okay, so road map for sovereignty. Sorry about my scribbling here. Road map for sovereignty. Okay. So all these things, in order to have complete and true sovereignty. Let me just ask, because I, I, I'm really in the mood for, um, now we didn't do a, you know as big of a promo. We didn't have the time to do as big of a promo on the webinar, so um, <clears throat> I'd like to have more people on. But for the people that are on, that are engaged, that are paying attention, um, can you guys uh, consider an invitation to interact? Feel free to raise your hand. I have a hand raised here. Uh, feel free to type questions in. And if you have your hand raised, you might want to also type your question in so that I know, uh, you know what your question is, so that I know if it's a good question or not. But this is the meat and potatoes right here that is really going to set you free, in my opinion. Um, and I just want to get some feedback and find out if you guys we're putting together a roadmap for sovereignty. What would the key elements be? What are the things that need to be in place in order to be recognized as a sovereign? Right? So I don't know if you guys, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird question because I don't know if you guys know exactly where I'm going with it, but <clears throat> where do you, do you start? I mean, you have, you have people that call, all day long, and they're asked like, "Oh, I have a, uh, I need to get a UCC filed, and uh, blah blah blah." And they call with some pre-understanding uh, or preconceived notion that having a UCC notice filed gives them sovereignty, or gives them freedom, or allows them to do uh, something that they were not allowed to do previ previously. Okay, so we're going to cover that and what that actually does and what it doesn't do. But what I'm planning on doing here is go over and there's all these pieces of the puzzle that you need to do in order to do what most people think that they can do just with a UCC. Excuse my poor um, drawing skills. There's about 10 things in total, and we'll add more if we run out of room. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody, does anybody want to contribute? Um, if, I, if, I, if I raise your hand, let me see. I'm going to, Nurika, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute you so you can ask a question. And hopefully you have an answer to, th to this. I know you had your hand raised for a while. Um, oh, there you go. All right, I think you're unmuted, Nurika. Here you Having some feedback issues there. I do hear that you are unmuted, but um, do you have a mic or something? Okay, uh, it's not going to work. All right, Lance, 
I'm going to unmute you if you have a question that's uh, on on this topic or something to contribute. You are unmuted. Okay, I typed my question in. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. I was uh, responding to, to, uh, to your initial thing. I, I, I said, how about recognizing and dealing with implied contracts? To me, that's one of the most important things. Well, recognizing your sovereignty is to deal with implied contracts. Applied contract? Im implied. Such as such as declaring yourself a U.S. citizen by getting a passport for a U.S. citizen instead of a national, uh, certain things like that. Okay, very cool. Whoa. I had to unmute you because for some reason there's feedback, uh, so I'm unmuting you while I'm talking, and then I'll I'll re uh, you know allow I'll re I'll re unmute you, and then you can bribe me feedback. But so well that's that's part of it is the citizenship, um, and that's why I kind of you know I'm spending a lot of time putting together an easy to follow roadmap, dissecting information, going to seminars, buying DVD courses, and going through, and trying to put together a realistic ways that people can get recognized as uh, you're not just a second citizen because you want to I mean second citizenship can be very helpful because if you get second citizenship somewhere in some you know Caribbean island or something like that you know you're not really scared that that country is gonna like declare martial law and put you in a FEMA camp or uh, throw you in jail for 20 years for uh, you know advertising or something <laughs> So, you know, you can declare citizenship somewhere where you don't think that they're going to be as brutal as in America. Um, and that gives you a lot of recognition because they're a recognized country uh, in the UN, in the Hague, things like that. Um, but you could also do the American national. But the other thing is to, is to undo your U.S. citizenship status or corporate citizenship status, because let's, let's, there's international people on the line, probably. Um, so how can you get in their system to be, you know, a non-corporate citizen? And there's ways to do that, and that's involved to do that, but that's that's a whole presentation on its, on its own. Um, so if you want to add to that, I'll unmute you again, and then I'll just continue going uh, along, but that's that's definitely on point, and we got another hand raised. So, um, yeah, so Launch, you're going to be unmuted, and you can put any final thoughts, and then we'll move on. Do you have anything else to add? Unmuted. No, that's, uh, you're on the right track. I, I would be very interested in, in learning the procedures for uh, getting out of the corporation. I've been working on that for a long time, as far as uh, warnings that and ask her if you're a U.S. citizen, and I always cross that out. But there, there's so many more things to do, and uh, if we're going down that road, I'll be very interested in seeing what you come up with. Okay. Yeah, we're really working on it. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I'm going to unmute you now because <clears throat> there's some feedback. Um, part of the game is just understanding that you're not, you know, like you, 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 you know, people that are new to this, you can understand that. You know, you're not a U.S. citizen, you're corporate, you know, the legal person, the all capital letters legal person is the U.S. citizen, right? But if you don't do all these things that I'm going to outline right here, and then I'm going to put together some sort of like an ebook or a, a guideline for you guys um, to always have as like a cheat sheet to know like, hey, what do I need to be working on, right? Um, even if you, if you assert... The position that, well, I'm not the citizen, I just use the citizen, which is a corporation, which is the all capital letters name, and that's not me, that'll only get you so far, because if you're accused of something, or stopped by police, or, you know, different things like that, or you have pending civil criminal, uh, pending potential charges, or something like that going on, um, in their in the in the government's database, you st you know you still are a citizen, and and you the person you the you the human behind the citizen is still the surety or the liable party for the corporation. And unless you reverse that surety ship, then you're going to get screwed, blued, and tattooed. 
as Jack Smith <laughs> says. I'll give him credit for that. <laughs> You're going to get screwed, blued, and tattooed. Um, so how do we reduce the surety? How do we put the world, you know, there are these processes that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with to put the world on notice or put the government on notice or put on the public record that, you know, I, I'm not the citizen. I'm assigning an affidavit. I'm declaring, I'm renouncing my, you know, that I'm not the corporate citizen. I'm an American national, yada, yada, yada. And those public announcements and records uh, and processes can be very helpful as a tool as part of this overall uh, about 10 or 11 point strategy that I'm going to um, share with you guys that we've discovered. So it's a that's one tool, but just doing the notice to the world that I'm not a citizen and, de and declaring that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be recognized. Like you're not, you know what I'm saying? Like you're not doing enough. There's other entanglements in the background that need to be addressed as, uh, as well. And uh, this is, you know, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, like for example, if you do change that status and do the other things involved, then you may do a W-8 form or you might do a, so this is like the tax the tax part. Okay, so you've got um, you've got the W eight, which is the certification that you're not making U.S. quote income. There's the reclassification of the entity. This is hard to draw or type reclassification <clears throat> so you can reclassify the entity of the legal person as a trust or as an estate and you can get different EIN numbers and get recognized by the IRS as a trust or as an estate and you can assert your status of what your role is in relation to this entity as opposed to it being an individual that you're surety for and as opposed to you being a um, you or its income being considered under the US code for tax purposes um, Instead of it being X, you know, you can reclassify it as Y. And it's a different form of uh, income in the eyes of the IRS. They have their own forms. And if you spend, you know, your entire life reading these things, <laughs> you can figure this out on your own if you know the definitions of words and you, you know, know what to look for and what you're reading for and so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to try to break it down in the material that we're putting, we're putting together. Um, but you can do something called a revocation of election um, so this is entity reclassification and the IRS has a form for it so you can just go on Google and type in you know entity re reclassification form IRS you can type in revocation of election now what that's all about is the first time that you file a 1040 for taxes or the first time that you file a W-2 um, when you apply for a job, that is your election to be volunteering into the tax system. Okay, but there's, there's a very, I'm giving you guys an over, overly broad generalization because there's a lot of things we need to cover. Uh, but if you look that up, you can read about non-resident aliens and you can determine if you are or have ever been a non-resident alien or if you will move to be the status of a non-resident alien and what that really means. And it's not necessarily what, you know, what, what, what you think it means um, right off the bat. So you got to read the Title 26 and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but these are some things to look into. There's W-8 form, the entity reclassification of the estate. 
the revocation of election and getting um, an EIN number, which is the SS4 form. And right now is not the proper venue to be spending, because we could spend a whole webinar just on this category. You know, so I'm just going to list this stuff here, and then in future presentations and future stuff, we can go over like each each little element here. So if you if you and then there's something called the IMF master file, and you can actually just look and see what the what the um, what the IRS says about what your status is and what they think about you, um, and that's going to all that all that that's going to determine their tax collecting practices with you and uh, so on and so forth, so. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Now, if you're going to reclassify the estate, I hope that you have expressed the trust with an express trust. Now, does anyone know the difference between the express trust and what other kind of trust there is, there's basically two kinds. Anyway, you want to type in there? How do we get these questions to show up? Questions, questions. All right, so what I was talking about was there's express trust and there's implied or constructive trust. So when you were born and they put the footprint on the registration or application for a birth certificate, that was the grantor's signature, if you will. That was that was the agreement. That was that signified the intent of the parties. Now, you can say that that's fraud and so on and so forth, and I probably would agree with you, but the you know how the trust was created was from your footprint and the height and weight of the baby, uh, which was the meets and bounds of the property or the res that was exchanged to the government through the vital statistics department to create the trust. So in order to create a trust, there needs to be initially at least, you know, two parties. The grantor or exchanger or creator or trustor or settlor. Those words are all synonymous. Trustor, settlor. <clears throat> and this is why trusts are so important because to really break free and, and get all this stuff, you really have to have a really good solid, solid foundation of trusts. So I would recommend to read Weiss's Concise Trustee Handbook. Um, it's spelled W-E-I-S-S -S, apostrophe S, Concise Trustee Handbook. There's several other trust handbooks that are free out there on the internet. You can use Google and you can find them. And getting a solid foundation about trusts is really the key because if you don't have that, then you're not really going to be able to get too much of a remedy with a lot of these things here. Okay? Because it's all a trust. And right now, you have been presumed to be one of the parties of the trust. So there's the, there's the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. And again, this is not going to be a whole presentation on, on trusts. I'm just going to try to touch on all these bullet points rather than go into any one area in specific detail. Right now, I'm just going to do this little roadmap. So your footprint signifies that you and your parents, with their consent, by putting the footprint on there, because your parents didn't contest and say, this is not by our consent, right? So your parents, because you were an infant of unsound mind, you can't speak for yourself, um, your parents created the trust. But you're aware, you're presumed to be aware that this trust exists, and by the time you reach the legal age of majority, 18, you can get out of it if you choose to. And you can say, well, this is, this is not with my consent. This was done by somebody else on my behalf. Um, and so you can uh, renounce your role in the trust, I suppose. You can re-express the trust. I guess those are your two options. You can re-express it, re-express the trust, or you can renounce um, 
your role, your position in it. But, you know, this trust exists. There are, it's a vessel in commerce. There are things that you can do with it. Um, so I don't really see a lot of people do the renouncing process, but, you know, you, you create your own remedy. Just because other people are doing things doesn't mean that with enough knowledge you can't go and create your own, uh, create your own remedy based on what you're comfortable and what you want to do. You know, like let's say you wanted to um, renounce this and say, hey, I didn't give authority to put my footprint on it. And if you put your footprints on a piece of paper and then said, I'm, I'm revoking this contract that was uh, this, this, this uh, exchange as the grantor of a trust, um, I, I did not consent to be the grantor of the trust. Therefore, this is fraud and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And if you bring that up in a courtroom or whatever, you know, I, I, with all these other pieces put together, so that's the key, is that whatever way you do it, you got to really have a leg on all these different circles. Um, doing any one of them by itself is not getting anybody any success because there's other entanglements. Like you can't renounce something and then continue to use the benefit of it, right? So if you renounce that I never gave consent and this is all fraud and then you continue to operate with the driver's license, you know, or the U.S. passport or whatever, then you're double-minded. You know, you're saying that this is fraud, but then you're, you're participating in the fraud. So rather than throw you in jail for participating in the fraud, they do something that's less harsh and they just uh, don't recognize your renouncement of the, of, the, uh, of the trust contract and you saying that it's fraud. So they're actually doing the lesser of two evils by not acknowledging um, what you're trying to do, uh, saying that it was fraud. Because if you're participating in the fraud yourself with all those other entanglements, then you know you're participating in fraud. So be careful, you know, when you announce <laughs> when you say that something is fraud, and then you continue doing it. Um, so what we're going to be going over here, hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to know how you can completely get out of uh, participating in the fraud, and then at that point you can announce to the world, you know, with a with a properly filed UCC and other notices and so forth that you know this this trust, you know, you can re-express the trust, or you can or you can you know get out of it entirely. You know, there's many different remedies. Um, uh, so this is the trustee. Okay, so it's important to know basics that the grantor or exchanger provides res or property that's put into the trust and in the hands of the trustee on the for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Okay, so a lot of processes that the secured party status processes that we um, work with people uh, and are about to work with much more people with. Um, you can actually, if you're re-expressing the trust, you can select your own beneficiaries for the trust. And in that process, you would send notices to the beneficiaries with certified mail, have them sign it, and so on and so forth, and uh, or registered mail or whatever. And you're also sending them certificates of interest. Okay, so if there's anyone that's doing a secured party sovereignty reclamation, you know, process and uh, not having a notice that's sent to the beneficiaries or certi and certificates of interest that are sent to the beneficiaries, you know, technically you don't even really have a trust. If you're coming in and re-expressing the trust and saying, okay, well, these are the parties, you know, who are the beneficiaries? And the beneficiaries should be notified that they are beneficiaries. And so you should have a record of sending them units, whether it's 5%, 10% per party, of interest in the trust. Okay, now if that's all new to you, you really need to read Weiss's Concise Trustee Handbook. I've been plugging it for years. It's not a long read. Uh, the second half of the, maybe it's like 72 pages or something, but the second half of it is just documents and templates that you can use. Um, and we're going to have a lot of those documents and templates available for you guys so that everything you need to operate a trust effectively, the note, the template for the notice to the beneficiaries, the certificates of interest, the registry of trust certificates and the trust, the meeting minutes, the appointment of the trustee, the declaration of trust, the bill of sale, 
um, the exchange contract of the res that created the trust, which might be, you know, an ounce of silver or gold. We had a caller say, oh, can we use $500 worth of gold? Yeah, you can use whatever you want. Um, and you want to know how to create, you know, what gives jurisdiction over the trust. So where the contract is signed, the address or location where the contract is signed, um, so you might want to use a non-domestic location if you want this to be governed under common law. You have to express in the trust what the governing law is, uh, what the venue and jurisdiction of any disputes related to this uh, trust uh, are. So in a lot of this, you're, you're granting um, jurisdiction somewhere. You can do that in the common law. You can do that anywhere you want in the world, really. And you got to really learn how to create... Um, uh, um, how to create all this done in the way that you know you want it. Now, actually, the first thing I should have focused on on here is actually the uh, location. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say location. Okay. General post. Okay. The most. Okay. You, the address that you use for your affairs is extremely significant in all of this. Extremely significant. So the address that you continue to use for your affairs gives residency and domicile. And basically what that means is jurisdiction. And so there's a process where you can set up, well, okay, so the traditional way that people try to differentiate and they try to say like, well, instead of living at 123 Main Street, you know, I, I'm going to spell it out and I live at 123, you know, Main Street. I'm not going to abbreviate the street. I'm not going to take anything that can be conceived as a benefit, right? I live at 123 Main Street. I got the name, um, you know. John Henry of the Doe family, and that's if you put the col you know the dash in the colons, or how about we go John Henry of the Smith family, right? And you can put the dash in the colons to abbreviate that. So that's the living person, and I'm at one two three Main Street, spelled out, city, state non abbreviated, because abbreviating the state according to the Buck Act. So this would be just to do the research on where this all comes from. Um, the government recognizes, you know, under the Buck Act, um, okay, when you abbreviate the state, how do we, okay, when you abbreviate the state, you're taking a federal benefit, and when you put a postal code, you're putting yourself in a federal military zone. And there's some stuff on our website. If you go to Google and type in um, postal code, uh, uh, let's see. There's a really cool thing if you type in um, scam. Hmm. YouTube. I can't find the one I'm looking for, but um, zip code. Brainwashing, commercial. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, I can't find it right now. But they, we posted something up there that gives you the whole history of the whole zip code thing. But you can you can do other Google searches and there's stuff out there on YouTube and so on and so forth. But you don't want to use the zip code. So what people usually do is they put the zip code in brackets, you know, blah, 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 blah. Or they put 9998 at the end of the zip code um, because uh, it's been stated that when you use the zip code, anything from 000 to 9997, that's the military zone. The postmaster who operates in the private and in the public, so the postmaster has a private capacity, his last four digits of his zip code, so you got the five digits and then the last four digits. The postmaster's last four digits of the zip code is 9999, 
and the general post location for like uh, diplomats or people exercising under the common law is 9998. But it, however, you can't just put 9998, you can't just put your street address in the 9998. That's not proper. That's, that's factually incorrect. So you can't, you can't use that and putting it in brackets or writing near the zip code or whatever and then writing, you know, non-domestic without the U.S. Um, is a way for you to assert your non-domestic address at the street location. However, there's a much more secure and stronger way that's going to hold up a lot more in, in court, in front of a judge, in front of, you know, there are, there are a lot stronger ways to assert the location. You can do what's called the general post location, and you'd have to go to one of the one of the one of the one of the main post offices. There are franchises of post offices that you cannot set this up at. You can even get a diplomatic post address location. Okay, and there's some technicalities into setting that up, but that's the one of the initial things is that you want to either have a general post location, a diplomatic post location, or even an offshore, like in some other country, okay, location that you can get mail at for the entity that you've reclassified. If you've reclassified the entity as a foreign to the U.S. estate or a trust and you're domiciled based on your express contract, if you are, if the location and jurisdiction and uh, contract is under the, you know, in some foreign jurisdiction offshore, now everything matches. You see how for tax purposes you're foreign to the U.S. The trust, you've got this paper trail, you've got the minutes of the trust, you've got the notices that are sent using this international address, you've got the forms International USPS Delivery Confirmation Form. Um, US Confirmation International. I can't find the form that I'm looking for on the spot here. Um, pink slip. No. Here you go, this one. This one. Here you go. Let me zoom in a little. So this is the domestic delivery confirmation <clears throat> within the United States. And this is the international return receipt for international mail. So just something to consider if you're really foreign and you're really using and you're really quote private and international as a jurisdiction you should be using the international mail delivery uh, whenever possible same thing with like certified mail is domestic and registered mail is international and private so um, just something to uh, to look into so so again so just to recap and then we'll move on to the next box you've got your offshore or non-domestic address. Now, if you try to use the street address and just write non-domestic, I don't think they're going to accept that pink pink slip. So you're kind of like, you're in a gray area where you're balancing like uh, with the green card, you know, and with the certified mail and stuff. But, uh, you know, if, if, some, if nobody challenges it, if it's not challenged in court, then it's really a non-issue. But if you want to feel good about you knowing in your mind and having all your ducks in a row and so that it can never be challenged in court although I don't think that it necessarily will be but if you really want to have uh, and be confident that this is an offshore trust that's classified under the tax code as a whatever it is a foreign estate you've got a new EIN number for it you're not using the social security number anymore you've reclassified it you said I'm of the legal age so this is like the notice right I'm of the legal age of majority, and this trust is not being administered according to my wishes, 
and this is uh, therefore fraud, uh, and so I have a right based on fraud to come in and um, be the trustee of this private trust and to operate it in the way that is in alignment with the grantor's wishes. And who's the grantor? Well, if it was your parents and you, and the res that was put into the trust to create the see every trust has to be created with the res. That's why they put the footprint. That's why they issued the birth certificate because they they put the title to you and they put the meets and bounds of the property just like real property. They put the meets and bounds of the property into the trust and that's why they have jurisdiction over you because they own you because you're part of this trust. However, they can't ever prove that because if they brought all that into court and, and then that was challenged, they just wouldn't want to deal with it. They wouldn't want it to be exposed and they wouldn't have a record and it, there's, a, you know, there's fraud because there's not a meeting of the minds. There's not an express agreement that that's what you're doing. So, you know, they have a hard time if you challenge it properly in court and, uh, you know, you know, you can, you can get them to back off because it's not worth being exposed and it's not worth the liability um, for fraud. Okay. Um, so anyways, you can send this notice and demand out to the world and to all the government uh, agencies putting the attorney generals and, uh, you know, everybody on notice um, that, uh, you know, you are asserting your God-given rights and you're re-expressing this trust and now you've got this UCC notice that's filed. And the UCC that's filed, and the reason why some people got into, get into trouble with UCC filings is because they do it as a lien, and the correct, well, I don't want to say what's the correct way. In my mind, the correct way to do the UCC filing is as a bailor, bailee designation. You're not doing a lien. You're not putting a lien against your straw man. You're not putting a lien against your straw man because then that would show up on your credit report and you don't want that. All you're doing is you're putting, the UCC is just used because it's a convenient way to create a public record. Now you are creating this new trust and you're putting res into the trust so you can use an ounce of silver, right? And now you're putting the world on notice that there's a bailment that's been made. What's a bailment? is when property is, again, okay, act of delivering goods to the bailee for a particular purpose without transfer of ownership. Bailment describes a legal relationship in common law where physical possession of personal property or chattel, which is like movable property, um, is transferred from one person, the bailor, to the other person, the bailee. Okay, so you can look up, read many different definitions, go into legal dictionaries, whatever you got to do, understand bailment, Bail or Bailey. Now you can you can look up the UCC one financing statement form, and you can see now they've updated these forms over the last few years. So they have different you you want to read the instructions, and they have different uh, things that they want on these forms now. But here you go, Bail or Bailey designation. Okay, so if you do not have any of these boxes checked down here. The default is that it's going to be a commercial lien. It's going to be the notice of a commercial lien put into the commercial registry, okay, and will hurt people's credit reports and so on and so forth if it's done properly and the notices are sent and so on and so forth. So, and that's why people get into trouble with these things is because they start filling out UCC forms without uh, having a background in commercial law and uh, people put liens on different entities like different government agencies and officials and different corporations that they think have harmed them, uh, even though they've only been studying this for a year or two or three. And, uh, you know, I just, I wouldn't do a commercial lien um, against another entity unless I have their express written consent to do so. Um, like if you if, if, if you're a bank or a lender and you give out loans for people to buy cars and mortgages and stuff, you know, you have a signed contract that's notarized by a, w a witness that this person agreed for you to put a lien and a notice of lien. And then they file this UCC financing statement into the county property records to record the interest in the property file so that 
there's a record keeping system of who has a lien on this uh, on the right to occupy the uh, the premises. If you're talking about you know real property. So anyways, back to in the trust. Um, this is the secured party. So this on the UCC notice, if you did a UCC notice, this you the secured party's mailing address you want to have to be that non-domestic or offshore or general post address. And the debtor, you can use, you know, the normal um, postal code address for the debtor, okay? Um, and bail or bailee would designate, and you would put the right language in here that would let the world know that this trust was created, and this is a this is just a notice that this trust exists, and this is what the trust is, and this is the property that is in the trust. And, you know, we're letting the world know, okay? So, again, that shows there's only one tiny, tiny, tiny little element. Now, if we can get back here. So, this is a whole process. Um, let me grab my notes. Ah. Oh, and by the way, back to this trust. This is where it really gets juicy because I haven't seen anybody do this. I just, one of my teachers... Uh, or mentors just came up with this idea recently and I haven't seen anybody do this but I think it would really help your confidence in your process and creating a paper trail so that cannot be penetrated like the more you do all these things properly the more it won't be able the, the more of a deterrence it'll be for the powers to be that try to penetrate your position does that make sense so I'm all for doing overkill. I am all for doing overkill, unless there's any, you know, disadvantages to, you know, to doing that. So now I don't think that this is overkill necessarily, but because your your private trust is based on a security agreement, So the debtor and the secured party are signing a private security agreement that you do not show anybody. You do not need to show anybody. It's a private security agreement, okay, which is separate but almost similar to the declaration of trust, which is the foundational, like, articles of, of association, basically. The foundational documents for the trust is called the declaration of trust. And we have a few different templates and things and uh, so forth. But the uh, Declaration of Trust, is all, you can also have a Memorandum of Trust. So you wouldn't show someone the Declaration of Trust or the Security Agreement. You might send someone a Memorandum or an Abstract of the Trust, like who the parties are. You want to give minimal information to anybody that's inquiring because it's really none of their business. But if you want need to show, you know, uh, to file as an attachment to the UCC, if you want to do that as an attachment, um, and and just you know put some additional information in there, um, if you want to put the um, you know the international mail uh, receipt number or scanned copy of it showing that it was signed and delivered to the trustee, <clears throat> um, that's you know one route to go. Um, now you scan that in, and there's a there's a rec there's a number on there that anybody can go to USPS.com and they can type in under track and confirm, and they can find they can show major major prima facie evidence, which is unless substantially rebutted by some other information, it's considered a fact, right? So by creating this paper trail that anybody can go to USPS track and confirm and type in this delivery confirmation number, now you're creating indisputable prima facie evidence. Unless somebody comes back with something, you know, high, a higher level of evidence to refute and poke and tear apart your trust, your position, which I don't see them doing. If you have all these ducks in a row, there's no way that they can do it and they will lose every time if you put up a good fight uh, and go to the right court for a remedy. And we're going to get into that later. So the bottom line is, I, I've, if all these things are done in place, and I'm kind of trying to get to the end and wrap it up, but if all these things are in place, if you do have a situation where someone takes you to court, 
civil, criminal, traffic, whatever. You can win if you know who to go to. There are certain courts that you can actually remove your cases from state courts and go to a certain segment of federal, federal courts that have a record of consistently dismissing people's cases with prejudice, including felony major criminal charges. As long as there's no injured party, right? As long as you haven't harmed somebody. I have seen these cases be dismissed and discharged if you can show enough prima facie evidence and all you got all these ducks in a row, but you can't you can't just have a UCC filed. You know what I'm saying, guys? You can't just have, you know, two of these boxes done. You gotta have as many or all these as possible to build up as strong of a position and defense as possible so that if you've got a lawsuit uh, or situation, you can put the burden of proof on them to prove that you're a U.S. citizen, right? Put the burden of proof on them to prove that you're under the, uh, that there was taxable, that you're under the tax, that, that that entity was under the individual, you know, tax, uh, you know, IMF co uh, code. Um, if you've got other documents that create a paper trail uh, that you're, you know, under a different status, you know, then that's going to help you. Right. But having all this, uh, like the trust is really the foundation. You know, re-expressing the trust is really probably one of the first steps. But actually, before you even do that, you want to get your, like, you want to get your location set up. You want to get the parties of your trust, you know, who your beneficiaries are, who is the exchanger, you know, who creates the trust, the exchanger or the grantor. If you're going to be the trustee, um, it would make sense to have a, a, a trusted person who understands this stuff. Who, who maybe you're, you know, you're going to be their exchanger and they're going to play some role for you and you guys help each other out and there's a partnership and you know, you know, you guys can work things out. But that's why having a study partner and having a study buddy and all this stuff is extremely important. Somebody in your local area who studies this just like you, who you guys are collaborating with. And so I just want to also let you guys know that um, understandcontractlaw.com has a product for those of you that are not already, uh, you know, uh, haven't made substantial donations to us, if you have, you know, just ask us uh, what we can do for you. But if you're on here for free and you've never donated uh, any contributions to us, I would recommend if you do not have someone in your area. Um, by the way, we did update the products and services section to the website, so you do not leave, need to log in anymore. You can actually just hover the mouse over product services, and you can get all the updated products and services that are here, and you can read about each of them just by clicking on it. So you want to hover your mouse over here and uh, scroll down. Study Buddy in your area is, I think, is one of the best val uh, value that you can uh, get if you're new. If you're new and you don't have someone that you're studying with, locally in your area where you can meet and talk about this stuff and share stuff and, 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 and become, you know, sign trusts and stuff together, you know, have a chips and salsa and guacamole and watch a, you know, watch some of our deprogramming series material or watch, um, you know, some Winston Trout stuff or, you know, whatever you're doing to absorb and gain more knowledge. Um, you know, have your chips and salsa, have your taco night, whatever you do watch an hour of stuff and get, and then you know fill the table with paperwork you got your printer you got your computer set up and set your trusts up you know set your trusts up decide come to agreements of of how you guys are going to participate and partner together and uh, if you click on here this will give you a little promo on uh, what is included in the study buddy package but for only two hundred dollar donation we accept Bitcoin, and we're actually going to be able to accept uh, uh, international currencies um, as a preference over U.S. dollars, actually, in the near future. But for the equivalent of 200 U.S. dollars, we will find someone in your area, because now we, we have a kind of a big list of people all over North America specifically, mostly, and we will go through our database and find somebody in your area that is commutable, you know, driving distance, public transportation distance, someone within 5, 10, 20, 30 miles maybe, maybe, maybe a little more, 
that is interested in really accelerating their learning just like you. Okay, so for $200, you can contribute and we will go through and find and interview people in your local area and say, hey, Mr., you know, uh, not Mr., <laughs> you don't want to use Mr., um, one of our one of our constituents is looking for someone in the local area to study with, you know, and then we'll exchange your guys' phone numbers and emails, okay? You guys can become friends, and if uh, if we can't do that, we'll we'll give you your money back. Uh, and when you guys link up and partner and get involved together, um, you guys can split the cost of any and all of our products for life. Okay, so you look at any of the new things that we have up here, you guys can go halves on it. Uh, we've always, always, always been very, uh, I can't think of the right word. We've been very open to uh, push, uh, you know, recommending that people actually uh, split the cost of the products. Um, I don't care if you have five people that all contribute a hundred bucks, you know, I don't care. Get, have as many people as possible get the knowledge and reduce the amount of expenses that you have to put out for um, any of our stuff. You know, there's no, you know, no sharing with your friends or whatever. You know, just obviously don't post the stuff on the internet. Um, but for 200 bucks, you can actually get 50% off of all of our products for life. Okay? So I think that that's a really good deal, and it was my effort to help to reduce uh, the expenses that you know are involved with, uh, you know, getting all these all this help and uh, so on and so forth. So you know, obviously we do need to have people on standby and staff willing to answer questions, answer the phone, answer emails, uh, and uh, we pay for our mentors to get knowledge and to spend all all day, all week, full time analyzing and putting together and piecemealing this stuff into easy to understand presentations and products and services for you guys. So you know, obviously we do need um, contributions to keep to, to keep going, but it doesn't mean that you guys have to pay full price for you know any of the services. You guys can split them. So if you're brand new, I recommend actually just going on the website right now and if you want to get some of the stuff but you you know you don't have the the money that we that we are asking for Listen to this, and then just uh, pay with any debit or credit card in here. There's actually four ways to pay. You can actually call. You can mail us a check or money order. There's a lot of different things that you can do. You can pay with credit or debit card over the telephone. Um, so there's four easy ways to purchase. So anyways, back to the presentation. But that's if you're brand new, I would actually suggest this is probably one of the best places to start. And if we do not find somebody in your area that is within, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles from you, and or if you do not get along with them, like if it just doesn't pan out, it doesn't work out, we'll just give you your money back. So I hope that that's fair enough. And that's in a way to help you uh, save money. We have a whole bunch of other stuff on here. Uh, check check out these other products when you get a chance. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go over all the products and try to sell all the products, but um, just check that out on your own. We did update that a few weeks back. Okay, so back to here. So that's that's what I recommend. If you don't have anybody that's studying this stuff, I would get the study buddy stuff. And you you, you know the trust needs to be at least at least two parties. And then you're going to want to send your beneficiaries can be companies, corporations, not for profits, charities, family members. Um, your beneficiaries are just really going to be who would you leave your property to when you die? Okay, so you know you don't need to. Um, that's already you're pretty much going to get that covered, but you want to know who, who the parties are that you're going to be doing and, and sending those notices and certificates to, okay? But um, definitely the exchanger and the trustee need to be two different parties that are, um, you know, consenting to a contract, and there does need to be a res, could be an ounce of silver, that is exchanged from one party to the other. And you can do that in pro you can do that in person, and you can sign a, a, a what's called the uh, bill of sale, the Schedule A property list. You don't need to do that through the mail, um, but you can use these same principles of this trust because a court case is a trust, um, a mortgage is a trust. So you can use these same principles once you go through and actually set up and establish a trust. You can use the same principles to re-express any trust that you want. You can re-express the mortgage as a trust. You can re-express a court case as a trust and use the same principles and the same, you know, 
common law, non-domestic location, offshore location stuff, and use the offshore international delivery receipts and file it on a UCC-1 with a bailor bailey with the attachment uh, showing, you know, the attachment, which is a scanned copy of this uh, return receipt. And now you're creating this indisputable record of this trust. And guess what? When people sign for the, whether it's the green card or the pink card, they're signing. So now you're getting their signature. Now you're showing the trust. So usually if you're, if you have an open court case and you want to, there are people that are using this, um, you can have the, the court, the, let's see, what if you're doing the, um, the prosecutor or the court clerk or there's, you know, this now is not the form to go over how to structure that, but whoever it is you're sending this to, who you're appointing as the trustee, you're getting their signature on here and then you're putting it on the, on the attachment to the UCC1 bail or bailee. Now you're expressing a trust and you're creating the proof of the signature and that the res was delivered. Now, in a court case, what's the res going to be? The res might be the ticket, the summons, the complaint, certified copy of it is the res because they deliver that to you. Don't they deliver the certified copy to you? And you're presumed to be the trustee in that constructive trust of the court case. So what you do is you re-express it and you make them the trustee and you put that, uh, you put that trust the, you know the documents in order of who the parties are and what who you know whose responsibility it is to do what and the proof that the res was delivered the proof that they signed and created a security agreement with you um, and you got all these elements in order here and you can probably you can do notice to beneficiaries and certificates of interest and if you issue all this stuff and put it all together and you can show all this I mean they're they're really going to have a tough leg to stand on um, because you created all this all this record here, you know. And again, but though if you have an open court case, part of that is knowing contract law. Uh oh, what did I do here? Part of that is either understanding contract law or just working with somebody that, uh, and we can refer you to people that just full time. All they do is they help people with court cases. If you've got all this stuff set up, if you have reclassified, you mean you've got all these things in order, they're really good at actually typing up court case stuff um, or teaching you to type up court case stuff or, you know, whatever, and putting really powerful documents that you can use in a court case to uh, use their codes and their case law precedents and all that stuff in order to get the case dismissed. Now, sometimes you need to bring that to the right jurisdictional court and sometimes the lower courts and the state courts generally are just going to plow over you because they don't really care. Um, so you have to go to the right federal court and you got to have the right you know motions to dismiss and all that stuff in order and you can get things thrown out. You can definitely get things thrown out. Now there's other there's other ways that we're going to go into to get things thrown out a lot sooner than having um, you know, motions to dismiss and things like that put together. And we'll go over that later. So, but if you reclassify it as an estate and you're going to be doing the executor position with the executor letter, which is taught by David Clarence and some other people, um, there's a one, one letter that you send to the court administrator that people are getting a lot of success getting the cases just, uh, you know, dismissed or just they they never bring it up again. They don't pursue it. They don't prosecute it. The prosecution asks for the case to be dismissed. So the executor letter is very, very powerful. However, I would caution, now I'm not telling you to do anything, but if you, if you are thinking and you have been researching this about using an executor letter, I would highly recommend that you get all this other background stuff in order. Um, the, the, the executor letter process, which I was going to go over on uh, the beginning of the webinar, but maybe next week we'll go over the executor process. But the executor process is a, is a very powerful way that people are getting very powerful remedies, stopping any court case in its tracks uh, very powerfully, and uh, stopping foreclosure cases, getting tickets thrown out, um, getting people out of jail that are serving sentences or pending 
court cases, getting criminal cases thrown out, again, if there's no injured party, and you're not under their statutory code, and you're not a U.S. citizen, and you have not been under their jurisdiction, the executive level works very powerfully, but then there's also where you can challenge jurisdiction. You can challenge subject matter jurisdiction and have them state their jurisdiction on and for the record. So that's the, that's the other process is if you have someone um, or get good enough, if you, uh, if you study the how to win in court process and you get some guidance or just, you know, with enough knowledge, put the stuff together on your own, you can request that they on and for the record state jurisdiction. Okay, and they have to do so. They have to do so if you present it a certain way. And if you got all these things in place, they don't have any jurisdiction. So they have to avoid the question, not bring up the case, dismiss the case, or abandon, abandon prosecuting the case. Okay, so those are really the end result. Now, a lot of times you won't even get yourselves into any sort of a situation. If you have all these ducks in a row, you won't get yourself into a um, you know, a situation where there's a court case for whatever it's whatever type of matter that it is, um, traffic, tax, you know, whatever, you know, mortgage, whatever it is. Um, but those are the two last steps. The executor letter is one route. It's a completely different route than challenging jurisdiction and doing, you know, motion to dismiss and, you know, answer and counterclaim or any of that stuff. Uh, removal from the state court to the federal court, you know, those are the last steps, but and all your other stuff needs to be in place before you do that, and then that's where you would get your remedy, and that's what we're seeing people get remedy. So let me just go over these other um, these other uh, points here. Um, so I went off on a little tangent there about the trusts and being able to use it in court cases and so forth, because I wanted to show you some practical, from setting all this stuff up, you gain a lot of knowledge, and you can use these things for those purposes. Okay, so I, I, but again, in this in this box here, you know, you can do an ID. You can get a non-government issued identification, um, as well. You can get trust. You can make your own. You know, the trust can make its trust private ID. There are people that are doing you know private license, you know, private plate, private trust license plates, and things like that. And if you don't have all your stuff in, in order, you know, you can get pulled over a lot. But if you have all your stuff in order. There's ways to do that. There is ways to uh, travel in a car and not drive a motor vehicle and not be under their um, uh, jurisdiction. But you got to have all these things in order first. So continuing to go on. Let's see. Um, um, the will and testament of the trust or any of the parties of the trust um, in the estate as well is kind of tied into this as well. Will and testament. Although that's yeah, that's not the trust expressed by itself kind of does that. You don't really need the will and testament, in my opinion. But I'm just throwing that in that category. Um, okay, so one of these other one of these other things right here is waiving expressly waiving revoking, rescinding, and denying all benefits of the corporation. Revoke, rescind, etc. Expressly waive, revoke, rescind all benefits. And that from the corporation. And look up Hale versus Henkel. And there's a great article on our website about Hale v. Henkel. Let's see. L.V. Henkel, Understand Contract Law, boom. Okay, so it's a really good article on Hale versus Henkel here that we did a while back. And uh, read that, but it basically, and this, Hale versus Henkel has been cited in other court cases. Now, this is a Supreme Court of the United States case. So it shows that the corporation acknowledges and recognizes sovereignty, that it cannot infringe upon an individual's sovereign rights. But it does say in here that if you take privileges or benefits that if you if you read into it and you interpret it it basically says that if you take privileges or benefits like most corporations if you're a registered incorporated corporation you're taking privileges and benefits because you're asking permission to operate as a corporation 
right? Which you don't necessarily need to do. You have a common law right to run a business too, and there are common law um, business trusts that you can run and set up without asking for permission, okay? That gives you more sovereignty, okay? And takes their jurisdiction away. Um, but this court case, which has been cited hundreds of times, has never been overturned, and has been around for all, about 100 years or so, is really the is really the most power one of the most powerful things to understand okay so that is what the corporation says that they can and can't govern okay what they do and don't have jurisdiction over okay so if you expressly waive revoke rescind all benefits and privileges now you're sovereign along with all the other steps, right? <laughs> so um, unemployment, social security, all those things, driver's licenses, all those things are things to consider on the list. Um, uh, when, you know, vote, voting, right? Why would you vote into the corporation? You know, why do you care what the, pro if, the if you don't have anything to do with the corporation, Corp, you know, the, the corporate governing corporation, right, the de facto government, people call it. Why do you care about voting who runs the corporation? If their laws don't, if their statutes and codes don't apply to you, why do you care? You don't have any authority to vote in their elections. But you did file voter registration. You did check off your U.S. citizen on there. So you got to rescind and revoke that. Uh, selective service registration. <coughs> <coughs> benefits and privileges. We, we will go into that at a later date and there are ways to get to get out of that and there are also ways I know people you know well how do I do the driving and driver's licenses and things there are ways that you can you know waive and revoke things and then there are things that you can still accept you have to you gotta it's it's, it's kind of a gray area okay so waive and revoke everything if you can if you live in a city and you don't need your driver's license don't have one. Get rid of it. Would be the best case scenario. However, if you're not willing to give that up, there are ways that you can structure your sovereignty, you know, paperwork and all these steps plan in order to make the distinction that, okay, I use this license and the corporation has permission to have a license, but I'm not the corporation. Okay, so that's part of like the secured party process, although it's a much stronger position to be in if you don't if there's no confusion and there's no you know questioning on whether you take a benefit or a privilege okay and we are constantly working on ways <clears throat> to do things and there are ways that you can get right to travel there are ways that you can get um, one of the key things is if you have a second citizenship that's how you're going to be able to get an international driver's license that is not issued by the United States or the or its franchise states, okay, state of Florida, Texas, whatever. So you know, look into the second citizenship, and I'm going to put together a whole like guideline on how to get second citizenship. Like if you're if you're Israeli, if you're Italian, it's very easy, right? Go back to where you know where you were born, where you originated from, and look at based on your 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 heritage where you can easily get second citizenship. There are places that you can actually just pay uh, to get a second citizenship because they, the, these smaller countries in like Latin America and Pacific Islands and stuff, they just want your money. Uh, and they know that there's a lot of expats or expatriates and people that are um, you know, researching this stuff and want to maintain sovereignty. So they will just say, oh, just pay us X amount of money. And it could be a lot of money. It could be like 100 grand, right? It could be 20 to 100 grand. Just pay us and we'll give you a passport. You know, we'll, we'll make you a citizen of our country. Now you've got this UN and Hague recognized citizenship and you can revoke the driver's license in the US and you can get an international driving license permit, whatever, that was issued by another government agency that is uh, not as fearful and big and doesn't have as many, um, you know, prisons and police and military as the corporate de facto corporate government guys right so you know wouldn't you rather have citizenship to some random island somewhere that doesn't even have a standing army <laughs> what are they going to do to you right they don't have a prison system they don't have that stuff so I don't mind being a subject to their citizenship 
because they're not really going to be able to hold, you know, they're not going to attack me. They're not going to do anything, and, they, and I'm not breaking any of their law, their codes and statutes anyway. But that gives you international recognition to do a lot of things. Okay, and when you're waving and revoking, you know, the driving thing is probably the main one. Okay, the driving thing is probably the main one. Um, can you get around it by being an American national? Right, by being a common law, you know, state citizen or private citizen, um, we're working on that. And the, the answer is yes, but it's 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 a little bit of a challenge. Okay, it could be a little bit of a challenge. Okay, um, and the the car would need to be in a trust, and the car would need to be paid for. So if you if you are making payments on a car, and it's best if the car, if you buy it right off the lot and you get the MSO. Okay, so I'm just giving you the nuts and bullets here. If you get the certificate of title, just go to Google and type in certificate of um, certificate of origin. Excuse me. Okay, certificate of origin. These are samples, also sometimes called the manufacturer's statement of origin. But look, certificate of origin for a vehicle. Um, allegedly, what they do is when a car is initially sold, they create this. This is the real title to the car. The certificate of title that you're given is just telling you that the title is somewhere else. So the real title is actually held by the state, and allegedly they never give you this certificate of origin. You can People have said, you know, they go back to DMV and they say, I'm bringing my car, the car is paid in full, I'm bringing my car to a foreign jurisdiction. I'm going overseas. I'm going offshore. I need my car. Uh, I need the certificate of origin or the manufacturer statement of origin. And uh, if you guys know anyone that's gotten that, please let me know. But allegedly, um, and I haven't tried it. I haven't needed to. But uh, I'm working on getting some feedback to see if anybody's done it. But you know, allegedly, it's pretty tough to do. And uh, what you what you can do to circumvent and the need to have to do this, because once you're in their system. You know, once they have, usually, um, again, allegedly they shred this and they put it on microfilm, right? So now you're trying to say like, oh, well, I'm claiming back the certificate of origin and I'm taking this to a foreign jurisdiction. I'm only using it in the common law. And then the cops pull it over the side of the road and they run it. They run your VIN number and everything and you're in the system. So they know they have jurisdiction over you because, or over the vehicle and the, and the traffic laws and whoever's driving the car and whoever's operating the car. You know, and they're assuming it's a motor vehicle. They're assuming you're doing commerce with it. Um, is because they have jurisdiction due to having the legal title. So if you're going to um, get out of the uh, the trap of uh, being forced to get permission to drive um, and uh, be having a better a better situation, for lack of better, I can't come up with the right words right now. The car needs to be paid in full and put into a trust, and it could be purchased initially into a trust, and especially if it's not a used car, if it's purchased right off the lot, brand new, and you get that certificate of origin, they're going to give that to you, um, or they're going to offer for you to file it at DMV for you. You're going to say, no, I'm actually taking this to France. I'm actually taking this to Africa. Um, I am taking this to a foreign jurisdiction. Don't file the certificate of origin with the DMV. Just give it to me. Now, boom. Now you can do some really good things with that. Okay. So another reason to save up money and to try to earn as much money as possible because uh, if you want to buy a car right off the lot, it's going to cost the most amount of money, and you can't finance it. So true sovereignty has a lot to do with, uh, you know, again, paying for a second pass citizenship and getting a, a secondary passport, paying for a car right off the lot, um, doing a lot of these processes take money and resources. So, you know, we have uh, we actually have a program that we give people for free to teach people how they can make more money and manifest and create. Uh, There's different concepts and principles that wealthy people have that broke people don't have. I would recommend this book, uh, The Ten Distinctions Between... Yeah, there's a great book. It's very short. You can read it in like 20 minutes. This is one of the best, simplest books of all time. 
the top, or you can get you can get an audio book. Uh, you can buy this audio book too. Um, it's only a few dollars on Amazon. You can go to Amazon. I'm sure you can get it for a couple bucks. The top ten distinctions between millionaires and the middle class. Okay, if you're not a business minded, if you're not entrepreneurial, if and even if you are, I mean, pick this book up. It's a really great read. And if you look in here, you know, millionaires think long term. Millionaires talk about ideas. The middle class and broke people talk about gossip. They talk about things and other people. Ask some positive what if questions every day and bounce ideas off successful people who will be honest with you. Millionaires work for profits. The, mil the middle class and broke people work for wages. Take calculated risks and learn to take advantage of good opportunities. So there's certain principles and habits um, that successful people financially do. And this is one of the most cut to the chase, simplistic, in a nutshell, uh, books that you can get. Top 10 distinctions between millionaires and the middle class. And we also give away to you guys on the line right here. There's a product at manifestyourwish.com. It's a $100 product, and we'll give it to you for free for being on this webinar. Um, if you go here the following is a page. and watch this presentation and read all this, um, there's also a, a list of good books here. One, another, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki is another book right along those lines. You know, Robert Kiyosaki, business partner of Donald Trump, very well off financially. Read that book. Napoleon Hill has some good stuff, Think and Grow Rich. Um, what's that book? Uh, the Magic of Thinking Big, definitely one of the best books of all time. So for those of you that are new to this stuff, pick up some of those books. You can even get them at a library or you can buy them for like a dollar, a used book on uh, Amazon or you can just go into Barnes & Noble, Borders Books, and just pick the book off the shelf, sit there for a few hours and read it. Um, and I'm going to give this product, which you can see is for sale for $99, Your Wish is Your Command, How to Manifest Your Desires, and How Anyone Can Make Millions, the Money-Making Secrets They Don't Want You to Know About. If you email me uh, within 24 hours after this webinar, and if you do not have this, many of you already do have this because this is we give this as part of the Empower Yourself Pack. Um, but if you do not have this, email me at contact at understandcontractloanyouwin.com and I will give you a free download link for this product, uh, which is one of the best products that I've listened to. It's MP, it's MP3 downloads and it teaches you how to become more successful and save up more money. Okay, So let's get back into the presentation. But yeah, so the bottom line is that a lot of these things uh, are going to cost more money. So to be sovereign, you want to have financial resources at your disposal. Um, in order to make yourself, uh, your, your sovereignty a lot stronger. Okay? So, waiving the benefits and privileges, what else is on the list? Oh, you, you could get, yeah, there are, there are ways to get um, second passport as an American national as well. Um, it's, again, it's, 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 a, it's a different leg to stand on, and it's something that you can do quicker. Uh, and we're going to have, by the way, this whole stuff, we're actually going to do this course. We were going to do this secured party creditor course going through all the secured party creditor documents, but we're actually going to go through a very comprehensive class, and we've been putting it off for weeks and weeks and even several months. So those of you that are interested in the class, um, if you go to our site and, and you go to our secured party creditor process, I actually have to change that. But it's actually, that's actually technically not correct. But here, here we go. When you go, when you, when you go to products and go to secured party class, this explains... This is a status correction sovereignty class. Okay, so this is not even the full extent. This is originally what we were going to host in the class, right? But this is not even the whole extent, as you can see in this presentation. We're going to go over much, much more and give you guys all the tools and four different methods. The secured party creditor process is one. The executor process is another, but there's, uh, as of now, and I might add to that, but there's four different classes or categories of processes that you can learn all about, get every single document for every guru's opinion on whether it's working or not, examples of it working, specific examples of people getting, you know, using all this stuff and then either doing executor and getting their case dismissed or getting a remedy or getting the IRS off their back or people challenging jurisdiction. So you're actually going to get a comprehensive where every step we're going to do screen sharing. If you can't make the live webinar, we're going to send you the recordings. We'll take all your questions. 
it's going to be extremely comprehensive, and that's the reason why we haven't had it yet. And actually, some of the people that said that they wanted to sign up for it, we haven't even got back with you and uh, collected your, your donations in order to sign up for it because we're still putting together the class. And we are just about done to do that. So you can sign up now, and you can put a contribution as a deposit down. But um, I just want to let you guys know that, obviously, look at all the scribbling on the screen right now. There's a lot that's going to be covered. And I'm just going over the concepts here. I'm not even going over the documents. You know, to go over every document, start reading half of the first page and then the last sentence of the last page and being like, okay, so basically what this document says and does is X. So on your own time, read this and see if you come up with that determination. Change whatever language you want based on how it fits your personal needs. Or, again, there's no, there's no, like, you can just take this class and learn about this before you do anything, right? And that's really the best, the best way to go. I would not, um, I would recommend to go through the whole class before doing any, any filings unless you have a pressing emergency issue that you need to take care of. Because you can always um, make the best decision as to what status and what standing you want to uh, present, okay? So, um, <clears throat> back on to here. Um, there are other things you can do as far as this uh, second citizenship, second nationality. You can also get involved. You can actually become a minister. You can create a church. You can create a congregation, and you can become a minister of a church. And that gives you a lot of advantages with freedom of religion. You can become a minister. You can become a pastor. You can set up your own corporate soul. You could be the overseer of the of the church. Okay, um, and but you got to be careful because there are some people that if they do that and there's you know a lot of uh, money that's flowing through and they don't have all the other things in order and they didn't do that properly, they don't have the tax forms that need to be in place properly. Um, there are people that have been operating through a church like as a business uh, for years and then years later they get um, charged with uh, tax evasion. Um, and I know a guy recently that got sentenced to only one year in jail, which actually was not that harsh, um, I think, because he actually kind of did the stuff uh, almost properly, and uh, there's some other things that happened there, but um, so you want to look at and make all, be aware of what's working in the field and what's not working in the field before you start, you know, just jumping into anything, um, you know, so what we plan on doing is also giving updates throughout the year, but we, we have enough feedback and knowledge to, to give you what we think based on a sampling of people and feedback, you know, what uh, people are being able to consistently get remedy for, like this guy and this guy, and there are certain things with this guy and all the stuff. So <clears throat> keep that in mind. But the church stuff is very powerful, freedom of religion, okay? And it's also where you can... There's going to be some partnership opportunities later on as well where you can actually buy land um, as part of a religious venture. Uh, that's something I'm going to go, that's something we'll just go over, you know, at a later, at a later time. Um, but if you, if you get involved with this and really want to take your involvement to the next level as far as your second citizenship and actually being a, a part of the congregation that's being created, there's things that we can talk about. If you're super, 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 super uh, want to push the freedom of religion thing, because that that's a that's extremely powerful. That's extremely, extremely powerful. But it's a little, it's it's a little bit more. Let's take a whole nother lesson. Um. Wow, it's getting late, guys. Um. I don't know if I have time to go over all the rest of the stuff here. Maybe I could just take questions. Nominee. Oh. Let me just go over this. Taking yourself out of commerce. Let's call it RFC, removal from commerce for the entity. Okay? So if the entity comes in to the United States and starts doing commerce, you, you cause yourself a liability. There's a potential tax liability. There's a potential, uh, you know, liability with, you know, with advertising, with whatever products, with, um, you know, uh, you know, F, you know, whatever is FDA. If you're selling, you know, uh, if you're selling products, 
you you want to use buffer well I don't know what you want to do but <laughs> it's a good idea to consider using buffers to take the individual the trustee out of commerce okay you can have other companies or other individuals act as nominees to be on bank accounts to create to get any licenses to create any records and you can actually not only for privacy reasons right to take yourself out and to be completely I don't like the word anonymous because it's kind of like it's got the connotation like you're uh, you know you're hiding from something right but to keep your privacy and liability as low as possible as an individual or for the trust or for the company there are ways and we can go over exactly how to do this but you can have a nominee register a company you can have a nominee be the signer on a bank account you can have the nominee um, do different things um, hang on one second guys <clears throat> okay let's see but the, but the bottom line here is removal from commerce as much as possible okay because they only have jurisdiction over commerce so if you're just a private individual, you know what I'm saying? If you're just a private, listen, if you're smoking pot in your house and you're not a citizen and you got, you know, you got all these classifications or whatever, you're not in commerce. But if you're selling pot to other U.S. citizens, well, even if you are sovereign, even if you are, even if you did rescind and, and have, a, have a different identity, have a different, you know, citizenship rather than U.S., you still are under their jurisdiction because you're engaged in commerce with their citizens. So they have the right to come in and protect their cattle and their subjects as to what can be marketed to them, what can be sold to them, that what they think is good or isn't good for them. Okay, so unless freedom of religion gets around that because you can have those citizens under different capacity become a member of your congregation and then anything that you do to them is exempt from... Um, in generally speaking, can be exempt from, because uh, you're not engaged in commerce, you're practicing religion, okay? And there's some very powerful health supplements out there, MMS being one of them. If you guys know anything about Miracle Mineral Solution, you know, very, very, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, I'm sure you guys know about it. Very powerful uh, to kill viruses, cancers, things like that, allegedly. But the reason why they're able to sell it to U.S. citizens on, on website um, is because uh, it's, has to do with freedom of religion okay so there's all these things that that we're, we're going to cover and I think there's only one more thing here um, ah removal from commerce kind of has to do also with using Federal Reserve notes or US dollars and we can show you if you have a website if you have a business if you have whatever you're doing how to set up international merchant accounts um, how to have uh, foreign companies, entities, trusts, things like that, so that you're not operating. Um, you know, you can have the the companies or the trusts headquartered or you know operating elsewhere. And um, <clears throat> you know, obviously, if you do if you do something as part of a private membership or a church thing or something like that, you can have people make contributions and donations, and that protects you as well. But if you are doing as a business and you're collecting uh, or making purchases and payments and so forth, the, the, the best way is to take or receive, excuse me, um, cryptocurrencies, you know, like Bitcoin, okay? Now, there, there's ways that you, you know, there's ways that you can, it's a gray area, but you can use, you can use U.S. dollars and you can operate using Federal Reserve notes, but you gotta understand, you know, the Federal Reserve notes have the Illuminati pyramid on it, right? And it's a trust. By you using those notes, it even says, in God we trust on the dollar bills. So they're telling you it's a trust, they're telling you that they're the grantors of the trust, and by using it, you have certain duties and obligations, and you're under their jurisdiction in some instances. Now, if you're, if you got all your other ducks in a row, and you're just using Federal Reserve notes, I think you can get away with it in most instances, where you're not substantially under their jurisdiction, where they're not going to prosecute anything just because you're using Federal Reserve notes. However, um, you know you have to be aware of that by using their money, it does in in a way place you under their jurisdiction. In a way, if you got everything else going for you. In most instances, you can do it, but why mess around with a gray area? And that's 
you know, that's why you can you can operate with bitcoins. There's no federal institution, there's no Federal Reserve regulating anything. It's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic currency, which is what we use anyway. When we use bank accounts and credit cards, we're using electronic currency. You make purchases on the website. So Bitcoin and other forms of cryptocurrencies. And we had a class previously on Bitcoin. We'll do another one for people that want one, but there's lots of free stuff out there. We have a section on our website about under free education about Bitcoin. So click that, read that, learn how to get started with that. And there's more advanced classes. And if you really want to go down a particular area, um, you know, get with us for a consultation or some sort of work something out with us where we can uh, teach you more about Bitcoin. Um, because that in and of itself is, you know, a three month training course, you know what I'm saying? So um, that's basically it, guys. You gotta have all these ducks in a row. If you're not using Federal Reserve notes, let me just recap. Let me go backwards now. If you're not using Federal Reserve notes, or they can't prove that you're using Federal, I mean, if you use cash to buy food like day to day, and you know, there's no record of it, right? But if you're if you're not if they can't prove you're using Federal Reserve notes or you're using something else, if you're not engaged in commerce and there are ways, you know, you're putting buffers, you're you're taking the light, you can create. Um, other corporations and entities to be the liable managing parties of those entities. Okay, so that's just you can create buffers for that. Um, you know, again, if there's no, you know, can you can you do commerce and can you use Federal Reserve notes and have all this other stuff in order? Yeah. Okay. But I'm just trying to cover all the things for you to consider and try to check off as many of these things as possible. I mean, a lot of you are going, a lot of you guys are going to say. Well, we, you know, I have to have my driver's license, and uh, you know, I can't give that up right away, and I can't buy a new car and get the certificate of origin, and I can't put the car into a trust right away, and I got so much stuff going on. Can you get away with that? You know, try to check off as many things as possible if you if you believe that is necessary. Okay. <clears throat> the notice to the world of your status and standing, the affidavits. Um, all those things. Oh, there's one other thing that I that I didn't mention here. Becoming the holder and due course of your birth certificate. All right, let's just do one other thing here, and that kind of that'll tie into the to the UCC filing. Okay, holder and due course of birth certificate. We're just going to put H. Becoming the registered owner or the holder and due course of the birth certificate. So now you're holding it. Now you can't get the original one. They're never going to give you the original but you're getting a certified copy and you're making a record. And if you look up the definition of certified copy, it's as good as an original when the original is lost or in the hands of the uh, adverse party. Okay, so if the other person won't give it up and you're demanding that they give it back and you're saying this is fraud, whatever, um, having a certified copy and having it apostilled, uh, and, you know, you, there are ways you can create international, there are exemplification, you can create international recognition, you can put the UN and the Hague on notice, you can put the Vatican on notice of all these things that you're doing. Okay, Vatican, UN, Hague. Okay, so um, that was one of the other key elements. And by being the holder in due course of the birth certificate, um, th that in and of itself is, whole, is, is another whole process and there's a bunch of other things that go in alignment with that, so um, you got to look into that as well. So um, I think I covered pretty much everything. It's a lot of material. Now this has nothing to do. We never even went into like how can you discharge debts, and I don't really want to get into that. I just want to stick this presentation on the sovereignty and stuff. But if you have all this stuff in order, right? What I'm getting from the field and people's feedback and how people are having success and how people are not having success. What I'm picking up and observing that I can report to you, my opinion, is that if you have all this stuff in order, now you can discharge debts. If you have an investment agreement or a bond with a financial institution. Okay? And that there's there's a little bit more of a rabbit hole there. I'm not gonna go into all that right now, but um, there, there's a way that, again, if you have a legit financial institution, you have a, you have a bond that's deposited with them, um, that's accepted by them, then uh, you can discharge debt and it'll actually be a, a much 
it'll, it'll be the strongest position that you can have to assert HJR 192, you know, um, you know, I don't really believe in the A for B thing, you know, but the discharging of the debt, right, with the set, set off, the right, to, the right to a set off, right, and the right to use HGR 192 and Public Law 7310, where the, you know, the uh, government will discharge your debts dollar for dollar. Okay, that whole process works if you use this. According to my observations, I'm not making guarantees or promises, and you have to make it work. There's still going to be court cases. There's still going to be where you have to push it through and force people to accept it because you still are going against the status quo. There still are you know, banks that are greedy that want to foreclose on you and then make money remortgaging the house. So you know, just because you have all this stuff in order doesn't necessarily mean that you can just you know, left, left and right just you know, skip around and be discharging debts that you or other people have. But it's possible uh, when, you, when you do this. I have seen judges just flat out deny and plow over people um, because they look in the background and you're, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't done any of this stuff in the background to give you any authority to, uh, discharge debt. You don't have a bond deposit at a financial institution that is linked to all this stuff. And, um, so it's kind of like a, it, 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 what people were doing, um, and what, um, you know, and I'm going to drop the ball here on, uh, creditors and commerce because, um, I like a lot of the stuff that they teach, but they never emphasize that you need to have all this stuff in order, otherwise the discharging the debt with the set-off doesn't work. So, um, you know, I've seen it work based on technicalities, based on you send, the, you, let's say you send Bank of America a bond to discharge and you keep it, you can win based on that technicality if you're good at, in court, if you can put a good answer and counterclaim and go, go to court. However, the state courts, the common pleas courts, the state courts, they just plow over people. They just plow over people. So people have much more success discharging um, or dealing with different debt issues with different financial institutions and stuff um, by public remedies, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, going to small claims court or going to federal court, suing them for Fourth Amendment uh, violations, privacy violations, uh, you know, uh, fair debt collection laws and things like that. Those things work if you can work it or get a, an outline and a plan of how to work it and you build up enough of a case where it's not worth their time. It's not worth their attorney's time. Um, so we have some powerful stuff that has worked and works for people that you can ask us for. But as far as set off and discharge debt based on HJR 192, um, you got to have all this stuff in order and you got to make the estate foreign and you got to have all this stuff. Otherwise, I haven't seen it really uh, work with any, uh, other than technicalities. So... Um, which is um, unfortunate because uh, some of those groups out there were teaching that you can just, you know, without having any of this stuff, you can just do A for, you can just write A for, you know, except for value and all these different things. And um, listen, guys, I don't know why six years ago people were writing accepted for value and mailing it to the IRS and people were having some debts discharged and stuff. I have no clue why that worked for a brief six month period of time. But uh, Doug Riddle went and put a video up on the internet, and it's still on the internet, and it's still on YouTube. And we get calls and emails every single day from people thinking that it works, and it doesn't work. And that's why we have a section on our website, um, A for V doesn't work. Read why here. Okay, so I think I covered everything that I, that I you know, to give you guys an overview and another presentation, upcoming presentations, we can do the executor letter because that if you're willing to do all this stuff and change your status and do all this stuff, which again, I mean, it's worth it. It's really, really worth it for many people, okay? And that's why people are doing it. But if you miss like one key element, then they have a leg to stand on and they can deny your remedy. But um, the executor process is working very, very well at getting people a uh, remedy and challenging jurisdiction based on all this stuff is working very, very well. So with that, I'm going to open up for questions. Next week, we're going to do the executor process. We're actually going to go in detail about how simple the executor process actually, the executor letter, one letter can actually get a case, um, you know, just dismissed and they don't want to deal with it anymore. And I, and I report you some real feedback from what's going on in the field about what is happening with other people's cases.
and uh, what we're finding with that. Um, and that help works with, again, tickets, foreclosure, uh, civil criminal lawsuits, a whole bunch of stuff. It's very, very powerful. If you don't know about that, you definitely want to get a next week's webinar because that's going to be a very, very powerful and exciting webinar. Um, all right. I rambled on for too long. Let me see. Any questions that you guys have um, in the chat bar? Okay, not chat. Questions. Questions, questions. I don't, I'm trying to... Mm, questions, there we go. Cool. All right, just a couple of questions. The email again is contact at understandcontractlawandyouwin.com. Send to all. Anything that I said that I would send you, you guys can email. And um, let's see. Where can we get more information about the executor letter? Is there anything that, like the easy classical deed poll? You, you can Google, you know, executor letter David Clarence and spend some time uh, looking, in, looking into that. We're, next week, we're going to do um, an in-depth, you know, sort just like I like to sort through all the stuff online for you guys and just break it down and tell you and, and, and break it down as little time as possible because some people don't have, you know, eight hours a day to research this stuff like I do. Okay. Where would you get your mail locally? Well, Thomas left the webinar, but where you, you get your you can get your mail forwarded from an offshore address, or you can get your general post at the post office. Your website is slow to load on my computer and phone. Am I doing anything wrong? I don't know, guys. Just buy a really good computer and a really good printer. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Just make sure you got some good stuff. Um, what else? Uh, you pique my interest so often. Tell me it's for another episode. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So, forgive me, David. All right, just trying to see if there's any other future questions. Yeah, you've been researching MMS for the past few days. Please expound. Um, you can yeah, you can message me if you want to know about health remedies and things like that. I know a lot about health remedies, um, a lot uh, cancers and all sorts of different things. Have uh, there's a lot there's a lot of things I've been researching about uh, over the years, so we can share information about you know there's intravenous vitamin C therapy. There's very powerful mineral supplements that you can take, ozone uh, that are apparently working for people. Um, so. Send me an email. We can shoot some things back and forth about that. Okay, David? Can't log into my account. Where's the free info? Um, there's no. We're going to get rid of the whole login thing probably, guys. So forget about logging into the account on the website. If you are an Empower Yourself Pack member, if there's anything that you don't have, just message us. We'll resend it to you. Okay, but there's a lot of material, um, and we, we're going to be uh, updating and putting all this stuff together for you, for you guys upcoming. We have a class upcoming. Sign up for the... Uh, secured party status class and or call us th during the day send us an email tell us you're interested okay just tell us you're interested we'll have um, a rep call you or I will call you and we'll just talk about what's involved in registering Travis says is this reclassification form 8832 I believe so yeah 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 if you if you just google re, uh, reclassification of entity IRS form, it'll come right up. I think I think it's eight eight three two. Is the world passport good? World world passport is one is one thing you can do. Recording in a family bible that that's all good stuff. Yeah, you can all t you can tie that into what you're doing and you can get remedy with that. Uh, a second passport in like like if you're an Ital if you're Italian or Israeli, you know, get Italian or Israeli uh, citizenship and you have dual you know that is or there's other things that you can do. You can get second passports elsewhere, but those are like the instant ways for certain people with certain backgrounds to get it. Um, I would get as many as possible. The World Passport, I wouldn't stand on by itself, but it's a good place to start, and it will work in most situations. Postmaster General to send mail to a P.O. box, not to your place, or like the idea of a microphone. Yeah, the post office box is still 
in the corporate jurisdiction. So you have to get a general post. You can do a Google search for general post. General post. And in our status class, we're going to go over in detail that whole outline I give you guys. We're going to start with the location stuff. We're going to start with the location. Okay? And there's a lot of other things that you need to do about your location as well. Um, so, yeah, the private login issues have been existing for months, yeah. That's why we're getting rid of the private login thing. We're just going to send you the material, uh, you know, via email. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm everybody at affidavits, you know, again, are you able to challenge jurisdiction, get the cases dismissed consistently with whatever you're doing with UCC 303603? And you're using commercial code, you know, you're placing yourself under their jurisdiction sometimes by using the commercial code because it's their code. What's the difference between W8 and W8BEN? That's just an abbreviation, Charles. It's the same thing. W8BEN. Okay, so I put my email in there, guys. Uh, contact at understandcontractloanyouin.com. Thank you. For, for those of you who stayed on the whole webinar, I mean, I really appreciate you guys. I really wanted to get this out and teach you guys a whole overview. There's a lot of details in here that I left out because we just didn't have enough time to go into every single thing. But this is the pat, the roadmap for freedom. And I will put together in an ebook or some, you know, easy to follow guide and post it on the website at some point in the near future. So... Uh, that it'll be easier to read and we will we're excited for this class obviously it's a it's going to be an involved class and so um, you know we appreciate you guys uh, participating so if you'd like to participate in the class uh, call us email us and let us know um, and we'll let you know what's involved okay guys thanks so much for being on anybody have any last question